Episode number 97 of People I Know Show, Kurt Carstensen, Between Some Cows, with Jeff Rindy on the Rindy family farm outside of Browerville where I grew up. Hi, Jeff. Yep. Good to meet you, Kurt. Good, good to meet you. No. Good to see you. We both were in school together for most of our years. I think I was two years ahead of you. I graduated in 04. Oh, three years ahead of you. So I'm the old, old guy here. So if you can summarize how this came to be, how is it that I'm living in the city and doing the things I'm doing and my family's farm kind of isn't what it used to be and here you and your siblings and your dad and mom have built up this big family farm. How do we go these separate paths? Tell me how this happened for you at least. It's, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I guess I can tell you how my story went. Yes. So after high school I graduated and went to Fergus Falls Community College and uh, took my general education there. I was going to go to, you know, use that and go to a four-year school. I didn't know what I wanted to do, wasn't real sure. And then after a couple years of college, I met my soon-to-be wife, Lindsay, there and decided I needed to come back and farm. I was missing the cows, missing the farm life, missing everything here. Had my experiences away from the farm and decided to come back. Had the opportunity to join up with my dad and we were milking 36 cows when I came back in 2006. And how many today in 2021? So today total we have 300. Okay, so 10 times as many 15 years later. Yeah. You said missing the cows and I never, I never missed any of it. You didn't. So, so maybe that's a reason. Like, I couldn't wait to get away from the farm. I never enjoyed, I shouldn't say never, so little of it did I ever enjoy. But I'd imagine if this is the path in life that you've taken and you missed things that you really enjoyed it as a kid being on the farm. I, I loved it. I loved the cows, the farm life, being out. I mean, there was, when I was a kid, I mean, I guess I did, uh, was slightly jealous of my friends that lived in town and could go see each other all the time and, you know, go to the gas station and get a treat and didn't have to work very hard didn't have to you know and that's you know maybe that's uh, um, something my mom and dad did right looking back is they didn't force me to be out here at five in the morning you know milking cows and doing all the stuff I helped on the farm enough but it wasn't like as a 14 year old I had to be out there working you know so there wasn't that pressure that it needed you know I needed to be there and so I don't know, just the way of life when I was away in school then and thinking about what I wanted to do, I just kept coming back to, you know, when I have a family and raising them, I want them to have the same experience or similar experience as I had okay. being in the country, being amongst, you know, nature, all the animals, just kind of having that freedom, that way of life. And, and so that, that was my reason to come back. This is something I'm learning more and more about myself. Well, one is like the fact that you missed it. I don't really miss anything ever. Like mm -hmm. it's, I know what it feels like to miss something. It's very rare where I miss anybody or anything. That's some sort of emotional thing I think that goes on with me that I just really lack that yeah. very often. But the other thing is, this is a very recent revelation. I very much tend to focus I'm a positive person, an optimistic person, I think, but I, I do focus on negatives in certain areas of my life. Okay. So all I can think back to when I think about growing up as a kid on the farm, I think about how hard it was sometimes and how many things broke down and how much trouble we had and just thinking, I don't want to do that every day. I don't want that to be my life. And my dad just being like, frustrated and upset more often than I would have liked him to be and probably more often than he would have liked to be but there's yeah. just so many things that were going wrong so when I think about would I want to be a farmer all I see is all these bad things that would happen that made the job so difficult but you tell the story and like all these lovely wonderful things that you <laughs> like from the farm and I, I recognize that those exist but that's just not where my focus goes I mean don't you remember we would get together and play softball games yeah but that's not your, farming that's like your... hanging out with the other farm people <laughs> it is but without the farm it wouldn't have existed right we used to into our it must have been like the edge of the hay field we would and I know yeah. it was on our farm sometimes yeah. maybe always we would mow a little softball field yeah yeah and 
neighborhood kids mm -hmm. would get together and it was a good time it was have you done that since no will you invite me when you do <laughs> we can yeah. okay so of the the ways that we are still in touch i think i kind of use you jeff anytime i tell someone like i grew up on a farm and they seem excited about it which yeah. isn't that often i right. guess some people are and i offer to show them what it's like on the farm I get a hold of you and see if you're willing to like give a tour, yep. which I think between you or maybe your dad, we've done that a few times over the years. And the most recently, the I forget what episode it was, but Natalia Cortez was a previous guest on the podcast yep. a few episodes back. She was very curious about what it was like yep. on the farm shows. She came here. She got the tour. Yep. You're an excellent tour guide. Maybe I capture some of this on the video for this conversation and show some of it, but as best you can, the modern farm, the farm that you have here, what's going on here? There's uh, so many there's, things, but how do you yeah, like, how do you summarize this for someone that would know nothing about it? There's a lot. Before I get started with that, I'll just go back to yeah, yeah. You, know, you calling me about tours and stuff, and I, I appreciate that, and I do think kind of my duty as a dairyman or as a farmer is you know, inviting people onto the farm, giving tours, showing what's going on here, because I think, you know, we've lost so much touch with what just happens on a, you know, just a modern, regular mm -hmm. farm. And so it's, I think it's really important for me and for, for our dairy community or farming community that we have open doors and we aren't afraid to stick our necks out a little bit and show what's going on and because it's, you know, it's exciting to me anyways what we do so I do like to show off you know what we have and 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 it is unique in a lot of ways <laughs> to what people are used to seeing it's funny when you said uh, sticking your necks out like that's what all the cattle are doing yeah they're all sticking their necks <laughs> out to get their get their brunch before milking tonight so but segueing into into what we have going on here as you can see we've got a lot of cows all of our cows are housed in this building all of our adult milking cows anyways and so there's three groups you can't see the dividers but three groups here they're all milking and then another group back there that is all cows that are dry so they're not milking at the moment uh, two months before they're going to give birth to another cat or to a calf they uh, they stop milking eat a different diet and kind of relax and lay low um, and you said 300, so about 240, about 250, 250 of them are 250 milk at any time, give or take, 10 to 20 percent of the herd is a, is a dry cow. And they're on a one-year cycle to have a calf once a year, about um, 13 months. 13 months is what it ends up being. So at 60 days after they have a calf, so two months after they have a calf is when we would begin breeding them again and trying to get them pregnant and then do the math on that. They don't conceive on the first time all the time, so, so it averages about 13 months okay. per uh, lactation. And you and I are sports fans, and I know in recent decade or two, the, the analytics and all the, the math and the numbers into sports has become a bigger and bigger thing. And yep. I'm aware that with the cattle, you're tracking the data on every cow quite specifically. Is this yep, there's, correct? Uh, if, you can, if you can see, some of the cows have collars on, and what those collars have is a little module that hangs alongside their neck, and so that's an activity monitor and a rumination monitor. So it measures how much activity that cow typically has in a day, and it measures that against the day before and the day before and the day before, so it does that like a seven day window. And so if their activity is elevated one day over a, a different day, that would suggest that that cow's in heat, mm. ready to be bred and ready to become pregnant. So we use artificial insemination here. Okay. So we use that activity monitor to tell when a cow's in heat to breed them. And uh, the rumination part of the collar measures when the cow uh, when you watch them chewing you'll see them chewing it's chewing their cud is what that is they'll actually regurgitate food out of their stomach rechew it up 
swallow it back down. And so that happening, there's actually a tiny microphone inside that, in the, that ru rumination monitor, and it's recording how many minutes a day they're ruminating. Okay. And so, you know, it gives a baseline of what's normal for that cow, and so if she deviates off that baseline, then we could, you know, potentially tell. It gives us a, about a day or two days ahead of when you would visibly see the cow sick. You know, if she went off feed and something was wrong, we would see that, you know, up to two days sooner than we typically would. So it, it gives us a, a mode to track who might not be feeling good and give them any treatments they might need. Or Are you getting an alert to your phone to tell you this, or do you have to go into the computer and, and look yeah, at it? Yeah, this one we have out? to go onto the computer and it's, it's right there, but uh, I think there's a way to set it up so I can <laughs> have access to my phone. Number 922 is in heat. I better go outside and <laughs> take care of it. Right. Is so that your job, the yep. artificial insemination? Yep, myself, my sister does as well. I guess I could go back to how this farm is structured. It is our family farm. Uh, my dad and my mom, she was a school teacher in Browerville where we went to school for, I don't know how many years, 30 something. And she retired a couple years ago. Okay. And so now she's helping out on the farm more with, uh, with calves and some young stock. And so it's, it's dad, mom, my sister, my brother, and myself. So all of us came back to farm, all three kids, you know, came back to the farm. And then we've also, as we've grown, we also farm uh, just shy of 3,000 acres of corn, beans, alfalfa. And so with that, then we also have um, four now, four full-time hired folks that help. So it's a big operation. Ends up being a lot of a lot of people, a lot of moving parts, a lot of you know, like you say, things go wrong. But you know, I'm a, I'm a positive person too, like you were talking about, and I I don't seem to dwell on the negatives. It's it seems like a new challenge every day when things are going wrong, and you don't quite know how you're going to get things done at the end of the day. But you get the most important things checked off the list and move on to the next day. And for your parents, and then I guess your siblings, depending on how you look at this, there's a lot of a lot more kids running around too. Yep. Do they all take an interest? Um, some of them do, some of them <laughs> don't, you know. Uh, my sister's got four kids, I've got three kids, and my brother's got two kids. Um, my youngest, my daughter, loves the animals, loves the cows. She's out walking calves, um, checking on cows, making birthday cards for cows. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my middle child, um, he's... He's into the farm. He likes being out here doing, you know, driving skid loader a little bit. He's 10 years old. Uh, my oldest, not so much. He loves reptiles, snakes, anything to do with, with that. Um, you could start a reptile farm, Jeff. We've got two garter snakes in the office, <laughs> so <laughs> we've started. Okay. <laughs> but, and as for Kayla's kids, you know, it's similar. You know, some show more interest than others. Justin's oldest son can't have anything to do with the cows, but everything to do with any piece of machinery. Okay. He knows more about any piece of machinery than, than I might know. So Good. It's, it is interesting how different they all are you know, and how they, they each take to it a little bit differently. It's, it seems like if you have a small farm these days, like maybe you can make it, I don't know. but. Mm -hmm. As you drive around either this area or just different parts of the country, it seems that the people that are are making this work have a big operation. I suppose like with most aspects of business, the bigger you are, the more efficient you can be in certain areas. And that's how you, you make the money that it really takes to justify yeah. doing it. Efficiencies have really driven and dairy is really, you know, an efficiency thing. And that's, you'll see a lot of consolidation with these farms that, you know, just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But it, you know, it is in the eye of the beholder too, you know, is our farm is big or is it small? <laughs> to me, it's big. To you, it's big, but in the scheme of, you know, the dairy country now, this oh, isn't yeah. that very big of a no. farm, you know. Dairies under 100 cows are pretty rare now, you know. There are some around, but, you know, it's getting rarer and rarer. Um, but you know, you're seeing these 
thousand cow, lots of thousand cow, two, three, five thousand cow setups, you know, is becoming quite commonplace and efficiencies are driving that. You know, you invest in a milking parlor, you know, high dollar things. To be efficient, it needs to run 24 hours a day. And but yours doesn't. No, ours is, but ours is a cheap one. We okay. retrofitted a parlor into our old tie stall barn. Okay. Um, so we and you're bring, milking 10 cows at a time in there? Uh, we've got eight cows that can be on each side. Oh, so, 16. so there's 16 milkers total in there. And so what we do is we take this group of 80 cows, we'll walk them down. There's a holding pen and then 16 of them can be standing in the parlor. And so those 16 milkers get attached by whoever's milking. And when they're done, they leave, 16 more walk in, and pretty soon we've worked through this whole group of 80. And while they're gone, well, you can't see it, but there's an alleyway here that we'll scrape with a skid loader, and we'll scrape all of the manure down into a channel in the center of the barn that takes, it's a flume that takes the manure away. And then we'll tidy up these, the stalls that the cows are laying in out here are sand bedded stalls. So there is no floor to them, it's about, you know, 18 inches of sand that's in there that they're laying on. So hmm. we'll level them out and add new sand if we need to. And uh, so that happens for each group. When they come back, then this group goes down, same process, and then group three happens down there. So it's about a four hour, three and a half to four hour process. And we do that twice a day. So in the morning from, you know, 5.30 to 10. And then in the evening, about five o'clock to nine o'clock. And then your hired help most days, they're there for those two segments of the day. Yep, yep. So we've got, uh, you know, full-time people in the parlor. Um, and then I'm typically up here bringing groups of cows down and scraping and, and cleaning the barn and tending to this. Uh, one neat feature, talking about just how this whole system works, is it's, it's sand bedding. So that gets kicked into the alleyways as they use it up. And then when that gets scraped down into the flume, it flows across and then outside there's a, a sand lane, a channel that the manure and the sand all settle out on. Well, the manure doesn't settle, that keeps flowing with okay. the water. And then the sand will settle out on the bottom. And then so we'll come back, you know, every few days, scoop the sand that's accumulated in that sand lane out, stack it up on a cement pad and, and then let that dry out. And after a couple of months, we'll reuse that sand for bedding again so so you're recycling as much as you can and so we recycle that so we really have eliminated you know we, we do buy new sand and we get that you know, from a gravel company you know they haul it in it's washed sand run through a, a little washer and so it's clean sand and we'll buy typically kind of February March April we need to buy sand because the stuff that we stack up you know in December freezes like a block and is is no good to us until you know June the next year okay. so so we have some storage for all that so we do have a couple months where we're buying sand but we went from having to buy sand 12 months of the year to about two months a year now describe what the life is like for these cows and I maybe we can go through the whole process of how you shift them like try to get a visual I know like they're going from they're older they keep moving on but once they're here this, I mean, they haven't agreed to this, but their trade-off is they come in here and they eat all the food, very nutritious food that you yep. feed them yep. endlessly, it seems like. I don't know when they stop eating, but then they go into the barn twice a day. They're creatures of habit. Most of them, once they've done it for so long, they just do it. Yep. And they don't really give up any issues. I'm sure some of them do. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's their life. They just rotate through every day and they eat a lot yep. and then so, yeah. so they're Elaborate here eating, um, you can't see them laying down, but there's uh, three rows of stalls in each, in each in pen here. And so they can, you know, pick a stall to lie down in with the sand bedding. Do they pick the same ones usually? They get in habits. Yeah. They're creatures of habit. Yeah. You know, if, if, if I need to find a cow to breed, I know a certain one's going to be over in that stall uh -huh. and a different one's over here. <laughs> and so, yeah, there is that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the lactation, like we were talking, after they have a calf, then they enter the milking group. And so they milk, and then at about 60 days, we can start breeding them. And then once they settle, once they become pregnant, then they get dried off two months before they're gonna calve. 
and they go into a different pen, same setup like this, but they're not going down to get milked. And then they'll have a calf down in, there's a bedded pack at the far end of the barn where we have straw where they can calve on that. And so then after that calf is born, then we milk that mom, that first milk, the colostrum. Mm -hmm. That goes directly to that individual calf. And then that calf's navel is dipped with iodine and put in a straw pen where it's, you know, cleaned up and, and good to go. And then, and then that cow enters the, gets a collar put on so we can track her activity and rumination. Because most of the problems, if you're going to have them, happen in that first one to three day window and then again kind of there's a you know 20 days is where other hiccups can happen you know low blood sugar things ketosis where we might have to give them an IV give them dextrose things like that so we administer all that stuff ourselves too and and so yeah it's not the norm but it happens and so it's and then they're back into the back into the cycle and for their offspring the, the the males, the bull calves, yep. do you keep any of them around here? No, nope. at about three or four or five days, they get sold to uh, another farmer on the other side of town that uh, raises them for beef. And the heifer calves, the girls, what's their process? How long before they're in this building for the first time as a, a dairy cow? Two years. Two years, so and they just kind of graduated from one pen to the next, staying with the same size. Yeah, so basically, I mean, to break it down, they go into an <clears throat> individual pen for about a week where they get bottle fed and started that way. And then they go into a group where we actually, we've got a automatic calf feeder that, so they have an electronic RFID tag in their ear. And so when they come up to that machine, it'll read what calf it is when they ate last how much they should be, you know, where they're at in their diet. So, you know, it measures out the right amount of milk powder, warm water, blends it together, feeds it to them, records obviously if they don't eat it and it has to dump it out. And so their, their, their diet is, is honed right into, you know, what day of life they're at and, and it feeds them a certain amount and then we wean them off of the milk the machine does. This is another example of efficiency. If you didn't have enough calves, you couldn't justify paying whatever price tag would have been on that machine to do that. Correct, yeah. But that replaces a worker for so many hours or so many so years, it, however yeah, you calculate it, it, it. You know, it replaces a worker, but it doesn't. It replaces the hand mixing, stirring of milk pails and mixing powder and water and feeding individual calves and bedding individual calves. It replaces that with you know, walking the pens, see if there's any calves that aren't, you know, feeling good, um, cleaning the machine, that all needs to be done every day. And so it takes away one job, kind of adds a different job. But it, you know, the technology in dairy farms and probably farming in general is, you know, you're re replacing these kind of just redundant jobs, mixing pails, carrying buckets of milk with, you know, caring for the animals or looking at them more and more mm -hmm. of the, you know, veterinarian side uh, of it. And actually, you know, dairy cows are no different with the, you know, robotic milkers. I don't know if, if you've got any, looked into robotic milkers at all? Have you seen any dairy farms like that? Besides what I've seen on your farm, I don't know if that's a robotic milker. Or so, I mean, we've got the robotic milk calf feeder Okay. We've also got a robot that'll drive around this lane uh, every hour on the hour. It'll scoot right along and it'll push the feed up, and so it does that through the night. So the cows are naturally kind of pushing it away by eating it. Right. And the robot comes and pushes it back to them. Right. So before we had that, you know, you'd come here at 6 in the morning <laughs> and it would be licked clean. And then there'd be a pile of feed <laughs> that they're out here that they the couldn't, earth. you know, sticking whoever's got the longest tongue gets to eat. <laughs> so now we've got that feed pusher that comes around and keeps that feed, you know, tight to the tight to the curb so they so can would reach it, be, it. Would it be true that the cow with the longest tongue is probably the fattest cow? Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it <laughs> sure could be, or longest neck. Um, but yeah, so that's robotic. But you know, thinking, you know, we have a parlor right now. So think of that as the cows are entering, you know, the milkers, the people that are milking are standing down about three feet in the parlor pit. 
those cows come alongside you and you can reach up so you're not bending over. The original way to milk cows was in a tie stall barn, mm -hmm. you know, where you came along a cow and squatted down or kneeled down. And, and much more exposed to the possibility the cow might not like something and kick you or back, kicked, yeah. back into you or something. Yeah, and so it is slower and, you know, more physically demanding. So this parlor comes in and everything's, you know, shoulder height. So everything's, you're not squatting over and bending so much. But now the newest uh, technology is robotic milking, where we would take our barn like this, and it would be this box unit that the cow can enter, and it's got a robotic arm that would come up, it would clean the udder, and then it would look at the teats, and it would attach each uh, milker cup to that cow. It would milk that cow. It would record how much each quarter of the cow is giving. Oh. and. Uh, measures the you know the temperature of the milk if anything was if the cow were to be having a fever or anything like that it measures all of that and so each one of those can milk about 60 cows and so with that you'd be eliminating all the you know this twice a day labor that we have which is a huge cost of farming mm -hmm. and with the prices of labor going up all the time it's kind of inflating quickly right now you know it's it's uh a technology that I could see being utilized a lot more, but there's a huge price tag to putting those in. But when you start to balance it out with <clears throat> the price of labor and where that's going to keep going, you know, they do start to make sense. And this is why this is happening in almost every industry. Yeah. It's costing more to pay people, and yep. someone's inventing some piece of technology that can do the job. Right. With that, with the cows being milked robotically like that, is something encouraging them to go in there or are they just knowing that they want to get rid of it? Yeah. Like these cows, when by the time it's time to get milked, in part it's a habit, but I also think they're carrying so much weight that they, they want to relieve themselves. There's a relief, that yeah, that, that I think they, they don't have you know, a problem going down and getting milked. It's not painful, they're not kicking, it's, you know, it's their habit and I think it does relieve them. It lets the pressure off, Yeah. but uh, a robotic milker like that, they would have, uh, there's some protein pellets, so part of, part of the diet in here would get pulled out, so you would have a little less protein in this. This is a fully mixed, you know, all the nutrients they need to maintain, you know, giving milk, becoming pregnant, being healthy. That's all in this diet. We would pull out some of that, and in the form of pellets, we would be feeding that protein to those cows. Would that be like candy to the cows? Where they Basically, would, so it would be a treat. They'd, you know, want, they'd okay. get a few pounds of this protein in the, milkers, <laughs> in the milker box. And so, but then you can also hone in and, and say, you know, because not all cows give the same amount of milk. Um, we average, it's 80 pounds a day on, on our farm here. And so that's about 10 gallons of milk a day per cow. Mm -hmm. And so some of them are giving 150 pounds of milk and some of them are given 30, you know. So it really does vary, and that's the neat thing with that feed being fed in, the, in a milking robot is you can adjust how much that cow gets. So if she's giving 150 pounds, you can feed her a little more protein. Because right now, they all get the exact same diet. The cow that's giving more milk, though, is eating more. So it's just kind of they naturally, you know, as their body requires more, they just they eat more okay. than the cow that's giving less. So it's just another kind of a neat tweak to the technologies. I think that gives a pretty good sense of the the dairy aspect of what you have going on here. You mentioned three thousand acres. Yep. You've got behind us here grain bins, giant silver <coughs> circular buildings that hold your, was it mostly corn? What else Corn, you soybeans, and then. So you're, you're holding these until it's time to sell them or maybe until there's a better price or to feed? What's the main reason that you have these? Uh, the main reason to have these is so when harvest time comes, you know, we've got a small window to do all our harvesting. We want to be able to get it off the field as fast as we can, mm -hmm. put it into storage here, and then we can start, you know, hauling it into town. But but to try to do all the harvesting and get it all hauled into town at the same time really really adds more time. So okay. just, just being efficient, getting it off the field. And then typically there is a better price if we can, I mean, 
a lot of people bring their crops in in October when it's harvest time. So is price so the, the price lowest at that time of the year? Goes down, not all the time. Okay. But typically, typically, if you were to wait till January, you know, four months, you'd see, you know, ten cents a bushel, better mm -hmm. price whenever you're, whenever you're selling. And it. I suppose if someone doesn't have enough bins to store what they have, then they are forced to sell at that time, even if the price isn't as good. And that's why you'd be forced to sell at that time, or you'd be, you know. You can lock in prices in advance, but that's always a gamble too. Mm -hmm. You know, corn was one year ago. It was two seventy-five. We sold. It was kind of just before harvest per time, bushel? and we needed to get yep two which, two dollars and seventy-five which cents per like bushel. Which kind of like acre is a a term of measuring something that's not used in most parts right. of the world. Like we right. use it on the farm, but don't really talk about acre. It's, I suppose if you're buying a a lot of land for a house, but sure. bushel, I don't know, I guess yeah. fruit sometimes is talked about in a bushel. By the bushel, so a bushel of corn is 56 pounds of shell corn. Okay. And whatever that might look like to you. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was 275 a bushel last year about this time when we sold, you know, just kind of cleaning our bins out, getting ready for harvest last fall. Uh, right now you could get $6.50 a bushel okay. if you had some to sell. Is that because maybe at least in part there's been a, a drought type? It's been weather? the drought. It's been I don't know if I knew if I knew why this pricing structure. It always know, goes up and down, works. and right now it's up. To supply and demand, it's it's a whole lot of things, and and it's definitely up right now. But that being said, those things, you know, the risk. If we were to sell all of our corn at 275, we wouldn't make any profit at all. We'd be losing money. Okay. If you're selling corn at six dollars, you know you're making good money. So somewhere in between there, you need the land, and so yeah, there's always that risk. Um, you know, we can contract prices, so we're calculating our break-evens. You know, with a certain average yield that we typically might get, and what it costs for us for our inputs, fertilizers, seeds, rent. Calculate all that, figure out what our break evens are, and try to sell above that number. And that's kind of where we target, and then let nature run its course with how our yields are going to be and what kind of weather we get. Like I say, we've this year's been a drought. I mean, corn looks pretty good. But you have irrigation systems on much of your farmland. About, about a third of it. A third. Yeah. Okay. So two thirds of it, you're relying on reasonably good weather and amounts of rain for you to have a good harvest. Correct. And so that's where, you know, I don't know why the corn looks as good as it does this year in spots. Great farmers. Yeah. Good soil. <laughs> I don't know. Soil's a, a good thing. The, you know, seed hybrids, the technology in those mm. continues to advance. You know, I talked to farmers that were farming in 1988, you know, a similar year to this, you know, weather-wise. and. I mean, they had zero for corn, and so that's the, the technology in these hybrids now. They can really do be a lot more efficient with less water than than we than we've had in the past. So thankful for that. Of what the cows eat, or all of your cattle eat, is almost everything grown on your farm, except for a few things you need to buy that are higher and some certain... Yeah, the majority of our feed is chopped corn silage. Um, so that's that's a corn stalk, just fully chopped up and processed up. And like a corn smoothie that isn't quite as liquidy? But not liquidy. And we, we put it on a big pile, pack it down tight, cover it with plastic, goes through a fermentation process. And then after about three weeks, it's stable and ready to ready to be fed and it just stays we make a year's worth you know in the fall when it's time to harvest and that's the stuff we're feeding right now is from last September when we chopped and so that's the majority of the feed well I guess probably about half of it the other half is alfalfa and so you know that's just a leafy shorter plant that's higher in protein and we cut that four times a year and roll it up into round bales we do that it's wet when we do that too, so we wrap it in plastic, it ferments and stabilizes, so we make a year's worth of feed in the summertime with the alfalfa. And then the, there's roasted soybeans in there. We grow soybeans, and so we take them down to get roasted, and 
and that's uh, another portion and then we've got ground corn so it's the corn after it dries down and we shell it out and grind it up real fine like flour basically and that's a high energy you know food so that's mixed in then other byproducts corn distillers that comes from ethanol plants um, and then the vitamins so we're buying corn distillers and we're buying some of the vitamins you know the, the micronutrients that get mixed in and so those are basically all we're buying and that's fed just to the, the milking cows the dairy cows not like to the younger peppers? the younger stock um, so they're on milk till they're a couple months old and then they switch over into a corn and protein so a shell corn and, and protein pellet diet and they eat some hay with that alfalfa and grass and then as they graduate a little bit older at about six months old then we put them on a, a ration that looks similar to this but it's you know it's it's lower quality hay not as dense protein because they don't need you know they don't need all that nutrients and, and stuff but you know we work with a nutritionalist that basically puts together a picture of what the diet needs to look like for each stage of animal and we mix that accordingly and do you have a nutritionalist for yourself do not but for the cows should have one <laughs> i need one <laughs> all right well that captures so much and i feel like I, i'd hope that even if someone had never been on a farm before that gives them a better sense of what goes on here yeah and for the video i'll get a few images I think that I'll overlay so it's just it makes more sense of some of these things that you're talking about yeah. but let's get away from what exactly you do here right now and yep. get into some of your ideas and some things that I know that we share you I don't know which one of us listens to more podcasts but I have a pretty good idea that we both listen to a lot of podcasts sure. and that you're in tractors a lot and doing different things and listening and you've shared things with me, I've shared things with you, and it's, we've had some good conversations in the past, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you through the podcast to yeah. get some of our idea exchanges back out to other people. There was two podcasts in particular that we both re-listened to that we had listened to before. And let's see, one was Freakonomics. The, f the oh, Future of Meat. Future of Meat, and the other was a podcast called How to Save a Planet. And the episode was called The Beef with Beef. And both of them with the focus on how there are a lot of people and some businesses recognizing that what we're doing with beef, how much beef that we're eating in this country and globally, that it might not be sustainable for some reasons. One of them being it is contributing if the climate is changing because of people, which I think most people now agree that that is, seems to be what's happening, yep. one of the contributing factors are these ladies around us. Yep. What it takes to get them to be as healthy as you want them to be, what they're eating, they burp a lot. And what they're, the way their stomach digests or however you're ruminating. Right, so, so they're ruminants. That's the, they, that's the ruminating. They've got fermentation happening in their gut. So they can eat whatever they eat, it ferments, and that gives off a gas, and one of those gases is methane. And so then that methane gets burped back out. And on one of these podcasts, I think it said it's like 17 times as damaging as the, the other greenhouse gases, methane maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not Whatever sure. it is, it, it's a contributing factor. So there's that, and there's a lot of other reasons why some people don't like the idea that, you know, we're, even though these cows seem like they're having a pretty good life, yeah. that we're raising animals to consume them. Yeah. Although we don't really consume these cows, we, the dairy, but for the most part, the so, high quality beefs that we're eating are not gonna be cows that have been milked for a decade. Correct, I mean, your higher quality steaks. These cows, once they, you know, things, if, if they stop being able to get pregnant or they're not giving, you know, they don't give much milk at all it's it's not a profitable milk cow yeah then they switch over to the beef side which unfortunately does end their life but they become hamburger and you know a, a protein packed meat right at least they've been fed well their whole life they've but it's probably not well. one of your favorite things to think about or does it, it not really it's not you? but then it's i mean it's 
it's the food chain. It's mm -hmm. it's it's I guess it's always been normal to me that we eat you know we eat meat, we eat animal products. I I would rather see an animal, you know, when she's no longer able to milk, being able to be turned into you know beef, something that's usable and not just you know an animal that dies and, and has no value. Mm -hmm. You know, so being able to utilize every part of the animal is just it is part of it. It's it's not it's not the prettiest thing in the world, you know, to think about it, but but it is life, it is one of the episodes, I think it was the Freakonomics episode, the uh, founder of Impossible Foods. It's Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, I think, are the two bigger names in yeah. the creating beef like products that are not made from beef, but they're trying to chemically create them to be pretty much the same. They've done, I, I think, a pretty good job. I've had it once or twice. I guess regardless of of how it compares right now, the, the guy said that by 2035, completely replace animals in food production. Correct. That's 14 uh, years from now. Like That was his goal a couple years ago. That was the CEO, the of, CEO of Impossible of Meats. Impossible, that, yeah. that was their goal. The goal to have like this not be a thing anymore, to do such a good job creating meat in a lab. Yeah higher quality for different reasons, lower price, et cetera, that people just choose to eat that over what was once living. First off, does that seem like it's even possible and from your perspective on things? And secondly, do you worry about like things are always changing, that it might be not the, as good to be a farmer maybe in 10 Things are always changing, I guess I don't, I wouldn't be shocked if the technology was there that it could be done. But whether you know everybody's going to embrace that and take to it, you know, the first time I heard that podcast, it, you know, I was just doing some thinking about it. You know, at first, at first, I want to get defensive because you know I'm a farmer and yeah. I've got animals and I should, you know, got to go into protect mode. <laughs> and then you realize, okay, let's just think about it. But then I start thinking, who's, you know, who's the consumer of this meat, like who, who wants that? Because farmers don't want it. Um, then I think the people that might, I don't know if I'm stereotyping, but <laughs> the people that want natural or non-animal, are they wanting something that's made in a lab with science and cells and, and organisms in a lab that just kind of create this meat? Is that natural? Or is it, you know, and then I kind of came to the conclusion it's probably the, you know, people that are really worried about the climate. If, if beef is the reason that climate change is occurring, which I struggle, you know, buying into that wholeheartedly that cows are our problem, but I don't know if that's just an, a bias that I have with my cows, but, um, but yeah, just who's the consumer of Impossible Foods or who wants that? I know that I've had it before and it's been perfectly fine, but every time I've seen it on a menu since then, I've overlooked it and gone back to my habits of eating what I normally eat. Yeah. I think so much of it is just habits. Like the cows yeah. have habits, we as humans we have, have habits. habits. You, you've really got to focus on ways to change your habits and be really motivated to change your habits. I think I would be perfectly fine with eating the impossible meats if somehow my habits shifted to it. I don't know what would be the thing that finally gets me to say, I'm going to do that all the time. Maybe if it just was widely available and eating meat grown on a farm was less available, less available. Yeah. and more expensive, then I'd probably would just... If you flip-flopped it and impossible meats were you know always cheaper on the menu and the real beef was more expensive and less available, I think that's what could flip it. Yes. So World, you know. on the menu of hamburgers, there was instead of one impossible burger and seven more typical varieties of burgers, if seven of them were impossible burgers made in different ways, some that were, they had the jalapenos and whatever, the things that I'm drawn to, it's not really the meat, it's the other things around it, the other thing that adds flavors. So I would right. probably very easily switch over if it was just the, the main option. Yeah, I think price would drive a lot. Oh yeah, you know, I like to be cheap this. when I can be. 
and so do I, you know. Um, I think, that's the other thing too, I think about with beef and less beef, you know, I think about what is the, you know, we can produce a lot of beef, we can do it economically, getting rid of that, and we've got starving people all over the place, you know, removing a good food source, unless that, I mean, can be replaced in just a good a, a manner and, and cheaper, hopefully, for the consumer. You know, it just, does it become an ethical thing too, taking away? It seems unrealistic here in September of 2021 that this is gonna happen anytime yeah. soon. They did give the example of was it the most commonly eaten meat in this country like 100 years ago was mutton? Mutton, yeah. Which is sheep. Yep. And the driving force behind there being so many sheep was that's how a lot of our clothing, like the wool from the sheep, yep. you would keep the sheep around, around as long as possible so they could keep on, you know, providing more wool. Yep. And once wool became less desired, people the market for sheep was less and less. Yep. So the amount of sheep to then be eaten was less and less, and we ate less sheep. And that example, I think, helps to give a way to conceive like, okay, in someone's lifetime, it doesn't seem to shift too quickly, but you can look back two or three generations ago, this was like this, and now yep. it's just not a thing anymore, really. I could see how a whole generation from now being different. I don't know how we're gonna like, get there, but I think looking back 25, 30 years from now, and we realize, yeah, people eat the impossible meats and the lab-grown meats. You know, that makes sense. 25, 30 years from it'll make sense, yeah. but I don't know how we're gonna get there, how that really would shift in that way and, and these cows would just not exist in the, the, the such huge numbers anymore. Yeah, you know, and farmers have a good way of overproducing. You know, farm, that's what we do. We get too good at something and you make too much milk and the market gets flooded and we have too many cows and that makes prices go down. Mm -hmm. Now that prices are down, we need more cows to be more efficient. And so there is that catch 22 of being efficient and making a lot of milk or making a lot of beef and, and running the supply so high that that demand's not there anymore. So, so yeah, I don't know what I don't know, it's a hard, it's a... <laughs> it seems like the market will dictate it. Like it will. If your yeah. corn prices stayed low at that 250, 275, where you're not making enough money, before long, either you or lots of other people would be like, I, I can't do the corn anymore. Meanwhile, yeah. if it stays at 650, people are gonna grow more corn next year, yeah. which is gonna drive the price down. Yeah. And that's, I guess, markets just, always dictate what's going to be produced and, and who knows how the beef thing you know if it were to go where all of a sudden impossible was a lot of the menu and regular beef wasn't much then all of a sudden regular beef might be really exciting again though people that want to have that and then maybe if i just have a handful of cows and i'm selling direct to my neighbors or consumers that really want that the value of my beef might be really high i might not might only need a few animals to make a, a good profit this is related to a different podcast episode that I know we both listened to recently. I forgot which one that was, but one of the reasons you have so many cows is because you're producing the milk. And if there was a less desire for dairy milk, which things could change, kind of like the Impossible Foods. Right. If you're drinking milk differently, if people are producing dairy products differently, and there's just, you don't have a market to sell as much milk, either some farmer is gonna stop doing it or you're going to have a smaller herd whatever it is then you suddenly have fewer cattle that you're breeding and keeping alive for a full life cycle all these life cycles to have more and more calves and the population is going to go down based on that as well yeah yeah so i don't know as all these new technologies evolve you know where will we be will animal agriculture start to go away i don't see that happening i really you know it's been a way of life for people forever, it seems like. And so, I don't know, it's, it's, I guess, hard to focus, you know, on that huge global thing. You know, a lot of, we just kind of get down into our, you know, ground level where we are here and do what we can with what we have, do the best we can. And, you know, 
profitability is a big thing on a farm and we need to make money mm -hmm. to, to stay sustainable and, and, and that's what we do our best at doing. And with your siblings and your parents, to me, from the outsider, it seems like you've all agreed that as long as this goes well, your whole working career is going to be doing this. I mean, maybe, maybe you think of other things. I don't know. You can tell me where I'm wrong, but you've, you're, you're building this in a way that this is what we do. If we keep getting better at it, we, we make more money, provide for the family. This is what we'll keep doing. Do you ever think about if you would want to or what happens if for some reason you wouldn't be a farmer anymore? Um, my wife, Lindsay, she, you know, she has her boutique and flower yeah. shop, Sprinkle of Joy. And, and it seems as we've gotten bigger, it's kind of freed me up too. You know, if we were, if, if it was just me and my wife and my kids and we had a 50 cow dairy, I think I would be way more tied down to that because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to hire people. I would just typically have to do everything all the time. With this type of setup, it does give me more freedom. You know, I'm working every morning, but typically then in the evenings, you know, the evening shift, I'm here when I need to be, or if there's something pressing in the fields that needs to be done, I'm here. But otherwise, you know, I can, you know, five o'clock, be back with the family doing other things. Well, then my wife with her business, she owns that business. And so, you know, I get into that a lot, which I do enjoy, you know, the diversity of mm -hmm. kind of switching over and, and helping out, you know, doing some work over there and, and kind of being an entrepreneur with her and following her dreams. And so I, <clears throat> it does give me, I'm not just <clears throat> on the farm stuck doing this all the time and and you know I think that's important too and being able to get away do stuff not be so tied to just this I think I wouldn't be as excited about it if I was just you know by myself 100% doing all of it growing up on the farm for me like I as it's come through in the podcast I go on a lot of vacations I travel a lot yeah. I like going places you wouldn't probably be good at having a dairy no, farm no. Right now, well, only one time <laughs> yeah. as a kid did my entire family leave for more than like 24 hours. We, yeah. if someone got married, we'd maybe hire help to to do the the milking the yep. evening of the wedding, yep. and then the next morning, if we stayed overnight in some city a couple hours away, and then we'd come back, and just I mean, no one would really take time off for many yep. weeks or months. One time we did a three-day road trip to the Wisconsin Dells, okay. like a was that a four or five-hour drive from. Yep from here and that was the only family vacation of more than one day we took uh, my entire childhood because of that I didn't know about like traveling I, I just was not interested in that and it took me many years to realize that I was very much sure into doing that but I noticed for you with this setup and what you've been saying you and Lindsay take vacations I'd imagine it's not that hard if, if any one of you here doesn't want to or can't be here for a little while. Yep. You, you all kind of know how to fill in and you can make it happen, no that, problem. Like I say, that is the beauty of having, you know, multiple people and we all know what's going on so we can fill in when we need to. Um, my sister was in Maine for a week and a half or two weeks. Oh, and nice. I took her whole family. They went on a road trip that way. My brother, in a few weeks, he's going to Idaho with his wife to get away. Um, we, you know, this spring we were down in Florida. So, you know, we're we all can get away and, and kind of get the break, which is much needed. And yeah, that really does, that really does. I, I think back to my childhood too, though, and we did, I remember going camping as a kid, you know, uh, we go for three, four days. and so Everybody would, would go? All five of us, okay. and somebody else would come in and do chores. And, and we went on a, I remember when I was about six or seven, we went on a two week road trip down to California and back you know, through Yellowstone, California, Kansas, made a big loop there. And, and so, you know, I got to give credit to mom and dad for being able to let go. Cause yeah, I, I always get frustrated. I, I read dairy magazines and stuff and I'll see these old farmers bragging in their in article that they haven't missed a, a milking in 32 years or something. And, and I think, is that the right? But maybe that's yeah. their sense of pride and that's what it. they like, but. I just think you have to be able to experience life elsewhere too and, and get away and 
and, and have those experiences. So. To make sure, I think, that what you're doing is what you really want to be doing. If there's something right. else that doesn't spark your interest, it takes more of your time in a way that you'd appreciate. Right. You know, I do, I do get a lot of value from just having, you know, like you saw my daughter Della when you got here, you know, I'm playing with kittens, she's running around with me, school's going to start next week for her, so she'll be back to school, but, you know, every morning about 8 or 9 o'clock I get a call from the house phone, and it's her wondering if she can come over, her brother wondering if she can come over to the farm, because we live just about a, across the field, basically, mm -hmm. quarter of a mile away, so they just walk over whenever they want in the mornings, and and they can just hang out here, you know, and be with me while I'm working. Um, you know, something I'm, I know I take for granted and I'm trying not to, but you know, working alongside mom and dad, you know, and being able to do that every day, you know, they're not gonna be here one day. And when that happens, you know, I'm gonna be really glad looking back that, well, it's been about 15 years now since I came back to, to work. So I've been basically side by side working with dad every day for 15 years and it's something that I'll really cherish when it's not here anymore. Be as honest as you're willing to be. All right. Did, did the <coughs> Rindy family get along pretty well in this, this setup? So all five of us have been working together since 09. So I came back in 06 and then in 09 we kind of lumped all, all of us together and so it's 2021 and we're still together. <laughs> so is that a, a good enough answer? I think so. I mean, we do, you know, I think it does surprise people sometimes when I say, you know, we work with, with the whole family here. Uh, we get along pretty well. I mean, it really is, it's, it's annoying, but it's a blessing, you know, to, it's not always fun to be working right next to dad or my sister or brother. But then at the same time, it's, it is rewarding being able to do all this, you know. Mom and dad have their grandkids here, you know. I, they've got nine grandkids that might be here at any given time, so that can get a little overwhelming, I think. But, but it is, you know, it's pretty neat that we can do this. Pretty neat seeing all the cousins growing up together. And so, you know, the, the times we're annoyed with each other or maybe frustrated, step back and look at the big picture you know we're doing something pretty special I think and 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 we all appreciate that do you come across other family farms that are set up anything similar to yours is that a common thing these days <sighs> not it's not super common to see like you know I've, it's three siblings not super common that you see everybody come Maybe back dad and one of the sons. dad a and a son or there's a, some brothers you know working together but but to have everybody it is I think fairly rare okay so, and it makes sense because I don't you know the way my kids are I don't see all of them working together you know on the farm one day but who knows that might might change things can change so that's been about an hour talk about talking about farming let's spend the last remaining minutes that we're sitting here in the middle of all the cattle you had brought something up to me a few days ago to shift this away from farming a little bit. You just, it was something to do with, you were having more thoughts upon how other people are thinking or, or living in ways well, that think, you hadn't yeah, I'm just, considered before, or is there some, that or something else? Or I'm just learning more and I, you know, I don't know where to go with this, but, but just, I'm really interested in, in how people think and how people behave or, you know, why people, think a certain way and it and it comes back to stuff like you know talking beef you know people agree with it people disagree how did we get to these points you know how to how do I handle when somebody has a different view than I do you know I think it's it's I'm starting to understand more that you know let's just take a vegan or a vegetarian you know, they've probably put a whole lot of thought into why they're doing what they're doing. And, and so I need to respect that. But then the same time, it probably goes the same way for me when they're thinking about me, you know, raising cattle and having a farm. And so I think 
I think if you sat down with people, you probably have a whole lot more in common than you think you do at the surface. And so that's, that's why I guess I do enjoy having a conversation like this where we can, you know, hopefully I can expose more people to the farm and what we do and, you know, if having more people out here or, or you know, showing, showing what we do. I think it's just need to tell our own stories. And, uh, if, we, if we could, like, start a, a new planet somewhere or redesign the way with all the knowledge that we have now of how things should be to keep people healthy, keep the planet healthy. You might not like this, but you might agree with it. This probably shouldn't exist. I think there's probably better ways to, to feed people, keep them healthy than raising animals to eat them as a, a, uh, the main way to do it. But uh, now that it does exist, like, I don't think it should like and, end. And I don't know if I'd agree yeah. with if you had a whole planet like that. I think probably the way our you know grandparents or farther back did it, where you know they would have never had 300 cows in one barn like this. It's fairly commonplace now, but but having a handful of cows, a handful of chickens, a handful of pigs, yeah. and a parcel of a land that the fertilizer, the manure from those animals is going onto that land and that grass is green and it's sequestering carbon. You know, that's a whole ecosystem that's happening there. Plus these animals are making food for people to eat. And so I think if we go back to that, that probably was the right way to do it. You know, it's, it's not really doable at that level anymore not with the the capitalist system kind of taking control and it needing to make more and more money to yeah. live a quality of life you yeah. need, need to find ways to make more money back then you could depending on where you lived and i guess if the weather systems came through you could grow what you needed and you right. could just have your yeah your little ecosystem there and you wouldn't have to buy a lot or trade for a lot you could survive on that yeah but life is more expensive you can't just keep doing what you used to do you got to find ways to bring in more income and that's why and and then it was just that family worrying about themselves taking care of themselves and you had a nice garden that you grew and you you know made your fruits and vegetables there that you packed away for the for the winter time but now we're at a point where we're you know you come from the city where it's dense and people there can't grow everything they need obviously in their backyard so how do they get fed well we need to feed them out here and we need to be efficient to make enough feed we could argue about whether the right feed is being grown or the right things are being done to make that happen but but there are a lot of people that need to eat and food that needs to be grown so it's structuring the system and I'm not an expert on how that all works and how to fix you know, fix that system. I'm not sure what to what to say there, but there's always better ways to do things. I am yeah. I am aware of that and and rethinking what we what I think I know. You know, I'm always trying to learn something new and a better way to do things. So that might have been a little harsh that this shouldn't exist. So I hope <laughs> that didn't like give you some pain or you want to throw a punch at me. But I guess my point was what would exist in its place or what or would it be a well was it i think one of the podcasts the the how to save a planet so this i guess we didn't get into this and i didn't realize this and maybe you did like the farm bill the way that farming gets certain subsidies to keep things in balance to make yeah. sure the food supply is in line with what people need the they were having a conversation about that on the the beef with beef episode of how to save a planet yeah and if that was shifted to, instead of promoting so much corn to be grown, to have at least, you know, still some corn to be grown, but subsidizing growing, they call it horticulture, like foods that we would eat directly, more of that, rather than foods that are grown to be eaten by an animal that we eat. Yeah. More, more fruits, more vegetables that, typically, I love fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Like I eat them all the time. I'm very like, habitual and maybe addicted to eating meat 
and not saying I should stop eating meat or people should stop eating meat, but I don't think it would hurt me to eat a little bit less meat and more fruits and vegetables. But the way that my life has gone, grown yeah. up on the farm, it's just my habit is to look, when I go to a restaurant, I'm looking for the meat. I'm not looking right. for the salad. I don't right. know. I'm kind of addicted. <laughs> I want to eat that. It's not necessarily better for me. I don't think we make food choices, most people, of what's better for them. It's more of habit and addiction rather than, is this really the best thing to be putting in my body right now? Yeah. So I think if there's ways to, if we were designing a perfectly healthy world for us to consume things and to live in, there would be probably fewer animals grown to be eaten and more just natural way, things to eat while still eating some meat. I don't think it's, I, I hear of a lot of people that stop eating meat and then their body doesn't react well and they realize they need to get more meat-based based proteins to stay right. healthy. I just, I think it's kind of getting out of balance, probably because we're becoming more wealthy on average and can buy more expensive meats and other things. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there is, you know, obviously we can get better at the way we do things. I would like to see more local, you know, kind of direct farmer to consumer stuff happening, you know, less, you know, of the large packers where it's just kind of, you know, so the, just thinking back to COVID when, when like these meat packers were shutting down, mm -hmm. it really kind of shed a light on this, I'd, I'd say a problem that when this packer had to close down, all of a sudden, you know, everything was relying on going to that packer. Well, now they, you know, were euthanizing pigs because they couldn't get them to market, but they needed room in the barns for the new ones coming up. So we've got semi loads of, of animals that had to be euthanized and not used. And it's like, that kind of blows my mind that we can't connect the dots from, you know, like those pigs have value and food and people are hungry. Like, why can't we take those and get them somewhere so they can be eaten? But, you know, people, the only people, the people that know how to do that didn't have the time and availability and space to do it. Right. And so we have less people that know how to do that. I don't know how to do it. Right. I don't want to do it. I'm thankful <laughs> yeah. that other people do all this work and then I can Enjoy work it. and make money some other way and right. spend it. That's how right. our system in this country works. Everyone can get really good at doing one thing and earn as much as they possibly can doing it. And then you trade that money for whatever it is that someone else is capable of doing. And enough people will be providing all of these services to keep it all in balance. And that's how it works. And if corn prices stay low for years and years, not very far into that, people are gonna not be providing corn anymore because they're gonna go to business or decide right. they wanna be making money. So why do this? Right. It all, it, there's a balance. So yeah, you there's remove this. one key cog to that because of pandemic time and then the balance just. And you, so it, it tells it me really we, need more, we need more redundancy or something in the system that, you know, pulling the cog out of one spot doesn't collapse a whole, you know, system. We need maybe mid-sized packers all around instead of a few large ones that are handling everything. And, and I think that was something that was exposed, has been exposed during the pandemic, how much we rely on things coming from overseas. So when one so when tanker shipping ports ship shut gets down, flipped over and like we can't do all these things. Suddenly, so more yeah. of this has to be done in this country so that we can keep moving if something happens. Right. I mean, pe people that are paid a lot more than I am, that are probably smarter than I am, I hope, are, are thinking about these things, they're working on out. how to resolve it. but. I don't think you ever foolproof the system. Something else happens at some point that either you can't foresee or isn't cost effective enough to even plan for. Right. And then it happens and then some catastrophe happens and then you react, just right. very reactionary. We can't plan for everything, but. So we got back into farming, even though we I thought- We did go into go farming, to... <laughs> we were steering away from it, but, but that's okay. Yeah. You're a farmer. It's what we're, we're sitting amongst it, so. I will have you do a being wrong segment. We didn't, we didn't discuss this in advance, but I know you've listened to the podcast once or twice, so you probably know what's coming. Um, anything else that you'd like to, um, to chat about a bit before we get to that and, and end this conversation? 
What am I missing, I, Jeff? I think about, you know, these dairy cows and the milk. One thing I would, like we're talking the food to, or going direct to consumer. I'm really interested in that. And, and so I've been thinking about ways to, you know, either through a creamery or making cheese or, or doing something like that and being able to set up where, you know, instead of selling to the co-op, this milk could just go direct to consumer somehow. So that's something I'm interested in. Um, you know, I make yogurt or cheese, dip a few gallons out of the bulk tank after milking, and, and I'm fascinated by how, you know, how milk works and how so few ingredients I can make different things, and and it's just it's I'm kind of been going down a rabbit hole making yogurts and cheeses and things like that. That is an odd thing. When I was a young kid on the farm, we would end up with a, a pitcher of milk that was taken right out of the bulk tank yep. of, of our milk that we'd accumulated from one or two dairy milkings and bring that into the house. But then we stopped doing it for whatever reason. We'd buy our milk from the store yeah. <laughs> and buy our cheese. Uh, do you, what? And do we you, do, we, you know, at our house, we're buying milk so, from the store. I mean, is but, that weird? <laughs> you know, I, I dip it out of the, you know, when you're getting it from the store, it is pasteurized. Do you buy beef from the store? No. Okay. No, no, we got all our own beef here that we utilize. Okay. And so. At least you got that going for so, you. So yeah, we don't buy that, but you know, I've really been into making yogurt and that's been, been really good. So I haven't bought yogurt for a while. So okay. I enjoy having that perk and making fresh mozzarella once in a while, things like that. And my kids enjoy seeing that done. So yeah, I get to utilize some of the things we make anyways, and not just sell it all. Very cool. I did not know you were doing that. Yeah. How about we do a being wrong segment? If you're able to, Jeff, think back to a past version of yourself, of the way you used to think about something, the way you used to do something, and now realize that the current version of Jeff Rindy would say that the old version of Jeff Rindy was wrong. Like you're okay. thinking about it way differently. You're doing it better. You realize that, you know, sometimes you got to make some changes in the way that you think. And I, I do think I have that, trying to think of something specific. Um. <laughs> the cow's staring you down. Right. <laughs> um. I guess my Oh, my biggest thing would, would just be being less judgmental of people, why people thought a certain way, and I kind of brushed on this a little bit when we were talking, um, you know, why, like use a vegan, for example, or something. If you're confronted by somebody that thinks you, you know, shouldn't be raising animals or have animals, and, and I think the current version of myself would be able to slow down and, and just say, you know, I see where you're coming from, or, you know, I'm interested to hear why you think the way you do and not get so judgmental thinking, well, you're, you know, you're not smart because you're not thinking the same way I am. <laughs> because I realize we can have different opinions and we can still be, you know, for the greater good, going the right direction, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Um. Yeah, I, one of the things I focus on, try to focus on, probably not always as good at it as I want to be, being curious. Someone has a different perspective than me instead of being like, you're an idiot or right. something. Or like, right. why do you think that? In a judgmental way, it's like, oh, explain more. Like, I, I am very curious, I just want to know more and sometimes I do come to conclusions and judgments that would probably be more like, you know, you're an idiot. I don't right. think I, I get there too often, but and I'm, I'm the idiot sometimes as well, probably more often than I, I would want to be. I think we all are the idiot sometimes. Right. Just not jumping to that so quickly. But I think we don't recognize we are idiots. You know, <laughs> a lot of the times one, a book that I'm reading right now, an Adam Grant book, um, you kind of showed 
me some of his podcasts in the past and that's how I got listening to him and so I'm reading one of his books and he talks about Mount Stupid and so it's kind of a, a diagram of when people learn a little bit about something they get really confident really fast but really they don't know much about it yeah. and so they call that Mount Stupid. He <laughs> said so many people die on that hill but then as a little more time goes on you realize you didn't know much about what you were talking about and so your confidence really drops so you've got this big mount that they call Mount Stupid and then it really falls off quickly but then as you start to gain a little deeper longer experience then it starts to really go up but they said there's you know there's that wave that Mount Stupid wave and I thought that's really interesting and and you know they I liken it to you know somebody watching you know a couple YouTube videos on something and, and proclaim themselves you know to be experts in a certain field from that and you know I think social media really plays into that stuff too we haven't talked about that but so much stuff is just surface headlines and and nobody really knows what's going on with things but it's all just knee-jerk and you know see that with activists against dairy animals or farming and things like that and those are the things that really used to bother me you know seeing headlines or things that you are reading and you're like that's not true but it's there and it's just you know how do you fight that fight because going on a Twitter fight or a, a Facebook fight doesn't do any good and it feels good to <laughs> be smart or feel like you're smart and to have something that's of value to say and I, I think we all do it to different degrees like if you're more confident you might act like you know more than you know or you think you know more than you know you might be on the, the Mount Stupid where you're right you know just enough to get yourself in trouble right. but not enough to actually back any of it up because you didn't do any of the work to get this bit of information that that sounds so good that you want to tell everybody right I think we're all at risk of doing it. It's just to, yeah, to be able to step back a little bit and just I, just listen. I love listening. Maybe I listen too much and don't put what I'm taking in into to practice right. as often as I could. I, I don't know. I find that too, you know, sitting in the tractor, you know, listening to podcasts for eight hours a day. <laughs> you get a whole lot of information. That is more than me, okay. <laughs> and great points. I don't do that every day. Okay. But. <laughs> Um, you get all this information, 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 and a lot of times it's, you know, comes in and goes out. And, and what it does, and maybe this is me defending my own habits and behaviors, is at least I'm, I feel like I'm introduced to new information. It sparks things. I'm, I'm not going to take this information I'm introduced to and go tell everybody about it in a way that I act like I know what I'm talking about, but by just ha having these introductions, just creates greater awareness for other things in the future that I might hear and just try to decipher it all to see is this worth putting more time into is this useful right I mean, what is it right I think we have a lot in common Jeff except you stayed back and was a farmer and I'm gallivanting elsewhere and I guess that's okay yeah it is I'd rather you do this and I do something else <laughs> But thanks for having me. No, this was fun. Thanks Help. for all the past tours and any future tours I might bug you for. That's just fine. Like I said, I like to, you know, show people what we got going on here and, and not try to shy away from it. Do you think the cows will remember this, that they were here for this recording of the podcast? I don't know. Um, a lot of them look a little bit confused about what's <laughs> going on, but... I think we'll be forgotten fairly soon. Okay. I won't forget it. <laughs> Jeff, thank you. Yep, Kurt. Appreciate being being on.